Sorry about that. Good afternoon, everyone. If I get everybody's attention. I realize they're still setting plates on the tables, but we have a very tight schedule, and uh, we wanted to get to the lunch program. So if I could beg your indulgence here for a minute, we're going to get started. So my name is Maury Ruffin. I'm the managing director of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine and its co-founder. And uh, I know many of you in the room here today, but I wanted to make sure I was able to introduce myself to those of you who I don't, whom I haven't met yet. Um, I want to just mention a few things at the outset, a couple of uh, housekeeping remarks. And but I, but the first thing I wanted to do was acknowledge our co-hosts and the sponsors of this event, with, without whom we could not do this. So. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, recognize Piper Jaffray and the Maxim Group, our, our two co-hosts. They've been tremendous partners for us with this. They've been both uh, worked with us last year on the first meeting, and uh, we really enjoy working with them. They're very easy to work with, and if we could give a round of applause to them for their support of this event. And then I'd like to, to recognize our sponsors. Uh, they are BioLife Solutions, Celgene, Lanza, Neostem, Progenitor, Cell Therapy, and then Westwick Partners. So if we could give them a round of applause as well. And then I wanted to recognize two very important people. Um, these are the two people who've been working tirelessly over the last several months to put on this event. Uh, and I'd just like them to, to stand. I know one of them's right here in front, Bethany Cranach. Laura, I think Laura is actually downstairs protecting all of our uh, uh, computers and everything else down there, but Laura has also been uh, an incredible um, force behind everything we've been doing here. The other person I want to uh, recognize uh, is, is the co-founder of the Alliance with me, Michael Werner. Um, Michael and I uh, started this adventure six years ago when we founded the Alliance. And uh, we work together every day on everything we do. And I wanted to invite him up to the podium to say a few words about what's going on in Washington. Michael? Thank, thanks, Maury. And uh, I'll echo my welcome to all of you. And thanks to the sponsors and, and partners. So I just wanted to very, very briefly talk to you about two um, important events in the regenerative medicine space that have really just come to fruition very recently um, in Washington. So um, the first uh, is that uh, legislation has been introduced in the United States Senate to um, create the foundation for a national regenerative medicine strategy. Some of you probably know that ARM has been advocating for a US strategy in regenerative medicine for some time now, just like the US has a strategy for broadband technology or alternative energy technology, we've been advocating that regenerative medicine is the kind of platform technology in healthcare uh, that the US should get behind in a, in, a, in a big way, just as we know other countries have done. So the legislation actually creates the foundation for that. It does two things. The first is it reiterates a call to the US Government Accountability Office, which is um, an arm of the Congress that does investigations and analyses of federal programs. And it calls on that agency, on that office, to um, do a federal assessment, strategic assessment of all the federal activities taking place now in regenerative medicine. All the different funding programs at NIH, at DOD, uh, at uh, the VA, for example, the FDA, CMS, there's about a dozen or so US federal agencies that in one way or another have their finger in regenerative medicine, and there's never been any comprehensive assessment of exactly what's going on. And we see that as a very important baseline in figuring out what the next step should be in terms of implementing a national strategy. So it does that, and then the second thing it does is it brings together all of those agencies with representatives from the private sector, including academia and patient advocacy organizations, to figure out, to use that study and figure out what should the strategy look like? What should the priorities be? Where's their duplication of, of research or resources being spent? Where are the gaps? And how can we all, all together come up with what a strategy should be and what the performance metrics should be for 
um, determining our, our um, accomplishments. So that legislation was introduced. It's a bipartisan bill. It was introduced uh, about 10 days ago, as I said. It's the first time there's been regenerative medicine legislation in Congress. It dovetails very nicely with the second initiative, which is a project that ARM has been working on with the White House um, for a few months now, which is to develop what the White House is referring to as a grand challenge in regenerative medicine. Their model for this is literally the moonshot, and what they are looking for, or to some extent, the brain initiative, which some of you, have, uh, I'm sure, know something about. It's basically a way of capturing the public's attention um, on the technology in this space and having something that it would be uh, uh, so captivating that it would lead to spin-off technologies to accomplish it. It would lead to changes in federal policy on the regulatory side, on the reimbursement side, uh, and it would be a public-private partnership between government and the private sector. We've been having some conversations about that. We have honed in on an idea for universal donor tissue um, the details of that idea are being fleshed out now, but we anticipate working with the administration over the next several weeks and months so that there will be some kind of an announcement, hopefully, this year. So there's a lot of really exciting things going on. We heard a lot of, and we'll hear more today, about the clinical advances in the space and the business advances, but there's also a lot of really important stuff happening um, on the policy and regulatory side. For those of you who don't know, ARM has a major event in Washington, D.C. It'll be next month, April 28th and 29th, where we have meetings and then we all go up to Capitol Hill and talk about the promise of regenerative medicine, talk about what it's done, what it can do uh, for patients and for our economy, and we'd love for you to join us and uh, spread the word amongst uh, policymakers. So with that, I'll turn it back to Maury, who will introduce our speaker. All right. All right. Thank you, Michael. Just a second. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker for today, and he's someone who barely needs an introduction, uh, certainly in this crowd. Uh, he is Silvio Tescu, the CEO and Managing Director of Mesoblast the Australian company, really the bellwether for this sector, the leading company in the sector. From the land down under, although Silvio, I gather you're rarely down under, uh, given all the work that you're doing these days. Um, but just a, a few words about Silvio and his background. So, um, so he is known internationally as a, a physician, uh, scientist in the field of stem cell biology uh, and many other disciplines. Uh, he's uh, previously a faculty member at Columbia University. Uh, and, is in, and is also an active faculty member uh, of Melbourne and Monash universities in Australia. Um, what he's going to do today, I, I, I understand, is tell us a little bit about Mesoblast, but really uh, some discuss some principles in the sector, and he is the professor. That's how he's identified in your program. So with that, I'd like to hand the podium over to Silvio. Silvio. Thank you very much for the introduction. I may be a professor, but I know nothing about technology. Um, so, so I'm going to take the opportunity to just talk a little bit about principles uh, that I think are essential to, to building a, a regenerative medicine company and some of the examples of what we've done at Mesoblast, which I think are generally applicable to the, to the sector. So. I think for, for regenerative medicine to be a sustainable industry, we need to take certain fundamental steps and learn from other sectors. S successful products need to be built on traditional fundamentals that every farmer 
company looks at. And I think the two major areas are commercialization strategy has got to be right and your manufacturing strategy has got to be right. And both need to be, to be dealt with in, in, in interchangeably. Um, at the level of commercialization, you've got to make sure, ideally, that you've got a, a decent platform technology, um, adult versus embryonic versus IPS, autologous versus allogeneic, for example. You've got to make sure that you've got a robust intellectual property estate. Um, a very strong cash balance is always helpful. Uh, and we'll talk more about those in, 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 in a minute. And we'll, we'll go through all of these in the next set of slides. Strategic partnerships are critical. We can't do these product development and commercialization on our own. And ultimately, I think it's, it's about making sure that you, you can develop a sustainable company with multiple products uh, around unmet needs and around certain competitor advantages. On the manufacturing side, in, in this particular industry, I think manufacturing is more important than in almost any other sector. Um, you've got to define the regulatory pathway, which is complex. You've got to control manufacturing. Um, products need to be delineated for both partners and for reimbursement. Very importantly, you've, at a manufacturing level, we've got to make sure that our products can be commercially scaled up. And ultimately, cost of goods is going to be critical. For, for a successful uh, product launch. And when you get all of those things right, maybe we, we might see a product on market. And in, in terms of the proprietary platform technology, the technology must carry inherent success factors to support product development and, and, and importantly, the business model. At Mesoblast, we, we um, decided that we wanted to focus on mesenchymal lineage cells, including mesenchymal precursors, mesenchymal stem cells, dental pulp cells, and adipose-derived cells. Um, for us, the, uh, it was important to, to lock in IP um, on, on um, the cell type, manufacturing process and indications. Uh, we took a view that adult stem cells had less uh, ethical or safety issues than, than are associated potentially with embryonic cells or with IPS cells and therefore um, it was easier to move into the clinic. Um, we've demonstrated excellent safety profile across multiple indications. And from a business model perspective, mesenchymal in each cells are very easy to expand in large numbers with ultimately low cost of goods and no supply constraints. And that, that underpins a, a pharmaceutical style business model. Um, and, and, and the t technical advantages of these kind of cells is that they're relatively non-immunogenic and therefore can be used from one donor for many recipients and therefore theoretically an off the shelf type of product with batch to batch consistency and a clear, rapid regulatory pathway. That's exactly what the pharma industry is comfortable with and used, used to, which ultimately is very important if, if one of the key drivers of, of, of therapeutic development is to have a, a, a partner um, reduce the risk uh, of product, product launch. In terms of intellectual property, um, we, we at Mesoblast own or have exclusive rights to more than 60 patent families covering mesenchymal lineage cells. Uh, the acquisition of, of um, Osiris intellectual property expanded our overall uh, IP quite significantly and was complementary to what we previously had. Uh, and, and importantly, we felt that the IP now covers very broadly compositions, cell extraction processes, manufacturing and indications in all of the major markets, US, Europe, Japan and China. Japan, of course, is becoming more and more an important uh, geography for us all, given the, the new regulatory environment in Japan that potentially allows you to have um, products launched uh, on the back of fa phase two safety data without the need for phase three trials. And, and I think having a major focus on protection of IP in Japan is gonna be a very important um, piece of, of company growth moving forward. Now, having a strong cash position is, is um, it seems to be obvious but really, we, we've got to be very clear that if we're wanting to build a company uh, in, in a new sector, we've got to learn the lessons of, of the leaders from, from other sectors. And you, you only need to look at the monoclonal antibody industry, which you know, I guess now is maybe 25 years old. But you look at who, who the leaders were in, in, uh, in, in this space, the standouts, of course, Genentech and, and Regeneron over the years, and look at what, what they've had in common. They always had three to $400 million in the bank 
at a time of, of multi-product development. And so if, if, you, if you're really serious as a company trying to take multiple products in regenerative medicine through to the other end, that's the sort of quantum of capital that's going to be required to, to drive phase three trials and ensure that multiple products um, are, are developed in a parallel um, parallel time frame to meet your IP life, lifespan. So th this is not for the faint hearted. It's not about having $10 million in the bank or 20 million. You've got to have 200, 300 million to, to be able to make the kind of large clinical judgment calls on, on reasonable phase three programs that are well sized with appropriate endpoints. Um, and, and I think you know, we're going to be no different than, than uh, the antibody sector. It's going to require a lot of capital, patient capital, from both um, private equity and from the public markets. And I think uh, it, it's terrific to see that the public markets are now embracing healthcare again and biotech and, and, and platform technologies. And I think w hopefully we'll see that regenerative medicine companies are able to access capital much more, much more readily over the next couple of years. Now, in addition to, to having enough capital to run your own phase two and three programs, it's critical that we have strategic partnerships with, with um, appropriate, uh, innovative, and, and um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies that, that are aligned with, with, with our technologies and our, and our way of thinking. Uh, I think strategic partnerships are important not only for funding, but for validating the technology, for access to, to um, strong commercialization, arms, sales, marketing, distribution, and of course, lots of other expertise that, that I guess we in a new sector and small companies just don't have. Our alliances to date at Mesoblast include in the cardiovascular and neurology space, Teva Pharmaceuticals. Um, for graphers, host disease, we've got a partnership with JCR Pharmaceuticals in Japan. Uh, and we've got a, a fairly unique strategic relationship with Lonza. Um, a, a biologics, uh, the leading biologics manufacturer. And, and this was a very important strategic relationship that, that I see uh, equally as important as, as our um, pharmaceutical partnering strategy, given the importance of, of manufacturing to success. Uh, and I think it, to, to be able to, to have a partner like Lonzo, or, or there are many others, or well, not many, but a handful of other uh, manufacturing groups that, that, that I think um, have similar sort of skills. I think it's really important to be able to to share in the uh, in the evolution of technologies that are going to be very important in in um, in, in commercialising our, our products at this point. Now, the manufacturing capabilities are clearly going to be defining in terms of w which products can or cannot be ultimately commercialised. Um, I mentioned earlier that the kind of strategies that you need to consider include control of manufacturing. That's that seems obvious, but but you can't have deviations uh, on a product-by-product product basis or, 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 or dose-by-dose dose basis. Regulatory compliance has got to meet best practices across all major jurisdictions. Um, you've got to be able to commercially scale up, and, and, and I think this remains probably the biggest uh, unknown at this point in time. Uh, what we're doing, and I think what many other companies are doing, are using existing state-of-the-art technologies that um, I, today exist in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the antibody space, for example, to allow us to scale up yield and to, to, um, uh, to, to provide the kind of um, volume for indications such as cardiovascular orthopedic disease where you're not talking about niche, niche markets, but you're really talking about high volume requirements. Now, um, improving yield and improving, improving capacity results in, obviously in, in significant reduction in cost of goods. And we've got to be able to, to reduce cost of goods to levels that pharmaceutical sector is comfortable with, um, the, the kind of cost of goods that approach, say, 5 to 10% of selling price. Those are real um, commercial considerations. There's, there's no point in, in developing products that cost, that, that, where the cost of goods are 50 to 60% of, of your selling price. That's just not viable. So I think you've, you've, you've got to work from the very beginning in setting manufacturing uh, capabilities that, that are able to be improved upon to reduce cost of goods in that, in that sort of manner. And, and ultimately, by controlling manufacture, you control your product life cycles and your product development. You've got to be able to control your process very precisely in order to, to change formulation or dosages, or to derive new products based on source material, 
or to be developing second and third generation products based on surface modification, genetic modification, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's the lifeblood of your life, life cycle um, of your next generation products. It's, it's the way that, that manufacturing will drive a sustainable industry. Um, and, and so by taking into consideration strength of manufacturing and, and financial strength, we've taken a view that to, to build a successful company in a new sector, you've got to be able to develop concurrently multiple products. Um, multiple product development increases risk-adjusted probability of success, leverages the safety data across a technology platform, allows refocusing potentially of clinical strategy as results become available. And I wouldn't underestimate this because it, it's only when you've had enough clinical experience and clinical data come back that you realize where your technology has the greatest value. And you're going to have to make adjustments based on the clinical data that, that, that comes back. Um, it also leverages IP protection maximally. And again, not underestimating this, but early success clinically with a first product launch, we think will validate the rest of a company's pipeline. Um, so in order to, to launch products and, and really build commercial outcomes here, you've got to understand what the regulatory path is for a cell therapy product. It continues to evolve, no, no question about that. And I think, as, as, I, as I stated earlier, um, the regulatory path for cell-based cell products combines traditional pharma approval processes with certain unique features. In terms of the standard pharma process, you've got to do your basic research. You've got to do preclinical. You've got to do phase one, phase two, and then phase three trials. That goes without saying. But I, I think what's unique to the cell therapy space is the variability inherent to, to our technologies. And that, that variability occurs at multiple stages. F first of all, the, is the donor allogeneic or autologous? Does gender, age, health, do, do all those things make a difference? Of, co of course they do. Is the tissue source important? Bone marrow, adipose, cardiac, neural? Um, there's more and more data that suggests, in fact, there's, that, that there's um, epigenetic factors that, that, that create so-called memory depending on whether the cells come from tissue A versus tissue B versus tissue C. Those are going to make major impacts on, on what the product looks like post-processing. How are the cells isolated? Are they is it through manual technology, through automated, automated devices? Um, if there's a culture expansion process, what kind of reagents are used in, in, in the media? Are we talking about serum, serum containing, serum free? Are we, are we talking about recombinant growth factors? Um, uh, what, kind of, what kind of product characterization have we used? Are we talking about surface markers? Are we talking about genotypes? Um, potency assays need, need to be developed. Um, are the potency assays linked to the mechanism of action of, of the cells? Are they linked to the disease state itself? Is the product cryopreserved? What's the final formulation? What are the comparability between lots and between products? And a minor change such as what, what appears to be minor in terms of adding factor A or factor B or reducing serum from 10% to 5%, for example, may make dramatic effects on the character of, of the cell and by definition create a new product. Those, those are the kind of inherent things that you just don't have with small molecules. And so the ongoing regulatory interactions are much more essential for our industry than for other companies and for other sectors. I can't stress how important it is to have ongoing regulatory interactions with, with the FDA or with EMA uh, at every stage. And so if you just work your way through, um, you establish a mechanism of action based on the science. You then do your in vivo correlation. You qualitative, qualitatively assay your, your potency and release criteria based on your mechanism of action. And um, it's important that you test these hypotheses and, and these, these um, ideas with, with the regulators at every step that you can. Pre-IND, um, at the end of phase one, at the end of phase two, um, even during phase three, it, it continues to be really important to maintain a dialogue whilst you're developing your final potency assays, for example or while you're establishing your final commercial manufacturing process. There are, there are very important discussions that allow you to, to change and put into, into, into your final process 
small minor modifications that the, that the FDA might, might be very comfortable with uh, as long as you've had a, a, a proactive dialogue. Now, for us at Mesoblast, before we move into clinical development, we take a view that mechanisms of action are critical and each product and each particular area and indication that we go after is driven by an understanding of the precise mechanism of action of the cells that are being developed. So um, we, we take a view that the scientific advantages attributable to the particular cell therapy being developed needs to drive the indication. Um, is the proposed mechanism one of replacement of damaged tissue by engraftment of differentiated cells? Is the proposed mechanism a one of repairing of endogenous tissue by secretion of paracrine factors? Um, ultimately, you, you, the, the company, the technology, needs to, needs to understand its own technology better than anybody else and drive its, its, its clinical studies and its preclinical studies based on mechanisms. For us, um, it's clear that our, our mesenchymal lineage cells uh, secrete factors that are that in response to signals from inflammation or tissue damage and that these factors in, act on endogenous tissues to stimulate blood vessel growth and maturation to reverse endothelial dysfunction, increase survival and improve function of various cell types including cardiomyocytes, CNS cells, bone forming or cartilage forming cells, reduce fibrosis um, and have profound effects on, on inflammatory or immunologic cells, particularly monocytes and T cells. Um, to, induce, uh, to induce these cells from being pro-inflammatory to really being anti-inflammatory. So if you understand all of those mechanistic um, studies, you can understand how we've gotten to the point where we've got multiple phase twos and now phase three programs underway. And it's not simply by a scattergun approach, but it's really well thought out indications supported by preclinical studies, large animal, small animal, large animal studies, and, and addressing where the, where the technology meets the unmet needs. Um, and as a result of, of um, combining our, our technologies with the, those of OSIRIS, we, we're focusing now on four major therapeutic areas, cardiovascular, inflammatory and immunologic, orthopedic, and oncology. And, and I think um, by the end of this year, we hope to be in phase three or beyond in, in at least one of each of those four major areas. This is a lot of work, it's a lot of um, undertaking, um, and you can see that if, the, if we were a, a small molecule company, we would be a sizable, sizable biopharma company with, with multiple late phase assets. But I think this speaks to the strength and the breadth of regenerative medicine. I think if you understand me mechanism of action of the technologies that we're all developing, you can see the breadth and the potential indications that, this, that these technologies are going to be very useful for. Now, at some point, um, you, you, we and, and everybody else are, are going to have to be realistic about what we can do with our limited resources and, and focus very much on end stage, the end stage game and, and, and phase three and beyond. But I think this gives you a sense of the breadth of this and the power, I think, of this type of technology. So where is the regenerative medicine sector and, and how is it performing? And th this is a a busy slide that looks shows you just a snapshot of a, a number of companies. Um, don't look at the one on the left because that's that's Mesoblast, but that, that's really the number of phase two and three trials that are underway. But what you can see, the important point of this particular slide is that many companies are now in in mid-stage development. Many companies are now in f at least phase two, and some companies are moving programs into phase three. And I'm very optimistic that over the next couple of years there will be products on the market launched and we will have a viable regenerative medicine industry. And how are we going to leverage these strengths? Profitability of success is going to be enhanced by, again, controlling proprietary technology through strong IP, by having products targeting major medical conditions for which alternatives don't exist, by maintaining strong cash positions and being able to drive our own destiny, by bringing partnerships to the table so that we, we, we share the risk and reward with our partners and by making sure that our manufacturing operations are viable, are solid, and are profitable, and they're aligned to our commercial strategies. Thank you very much. We have a tight schedule this afternoon, so we're not going to be able to take questions right now.